Railroad Alley is where I lived in Middletown, Connecticut. It was just a dirt road. There was a factory. Oh, no, it wasn't a factory. It was the lumber yard. Uh, and we lived in the houses which must have been put there for people who had worked for the lumber yard at some time. Who would imagine that from this humble beginning would emerge a person with a spirit that transcended all boundaries and a voice that expressed the story of a people, a person whose music would touch the souls of many through opera, spirituals, folk, protest songs and classical songs sung in Spanish, French and Italian. Now 86 and living in California, Hope Foy vividly remembers a childhood of deprivation. It's not the background that typically leads to an international career as a singer, teacher and actress. It did, however, prepare her to become the social activist who then, as now, believes in freedom. Union Bank of California is pleased to present Singing Her Song, the story of Hope Foy, the sixth in a series of special Black History Month audio compact discs. This is the story of a woman named Hope, whose extraordinary voice and unstoppable spirit took her around the globe, sharing her music and making her mark in the struggle for equality. Born Margaret Frances Hope Wainwright, later known as Hope Foy, it became apparent at an early age that the small town in Connecticut where she grew up could not confine Hope's aspirations. Hope grew up in a time when coal was used for cooking and heating in the home. As a child, Hope was so poor she needed to gather discarded coals from passing trains. Even this task did not diminish her spirit. Railroad Alley is where we were all very, very poor. It wasn't the ghetto of the, of the blacks. It was the ghetto of the poor. And I used to go out to the railroad tracks where they would be bringing coal. As they went by our houses, they would be rattling along, and coal would fall off. And I used to go out with a pail and pick up the pieces of coal and bring them home and feel very proud of myself that I was able to carry that pail. Growing up, Hope always enjoyed singing. At the age of 14, a scholarship took Hope to Hartford's Hart School of Music, where her instructors were sure her voice was destined for the Metropolitan Opera House in New York, often referred to as the Met. However, when it was time for her audition, bigotry denied Hope that chance, as the scout from the Met refused to even look at her once he discovered she was black. He did not acknowledge her introduction, as he only auditioned white performers. Unfortunately, Hope had other challenges finding work. Hope did not fit the image of the day for black performers. She had a slender figure and a classical music background. Although she found some work, for Hope, it just wasn't the kind that she had yearned for. Cafe Society was a very famous club, supper club, and all of anybody who was anybody would go there. Barney Josephson was trying to break the, the barriers uh, on race, so he had an interracial uh, cast, cast, we weren't cast, but, you know, artists, I didn't have any of the stereotypical things that black women are supposed to have. I was too old to be one of the children in Porgy and Bess, but I wasn't young enough to be anything else. So um, I ended up at Cafe Society, which um, everybody thought how lucky I was, and I thought how terrible I'm in a cellar. 
No, the the opera was a stage, but but the cellar was cafe society. You went downstairs into the dark. I don't want to be in the cellar. I was not the happy camper that I was supposed to be. Barney Josephson, the owner of Cafe Society in the 1940s, wanted to integrate minorities into the mainstream art scene. Although he was successful in launching the careers of many African-American performers, such as Lena Horne, Art Tatum, Hazel Scott, and Ella Fitzgerald, Hope did not feel that Cafe Society was the right place for an opera singer. Nonetheless, her experience there became a launching pad for her to join the casts of Broadway and off-Broadway shows. While living in New York, Hope was very active in the movement for social justice. She often performed on street corners in artistic protest of the inequalities of the day. Looking back, Hope recalls that the seeds of activism were planted many years earlier, when a discovery of the black press, the Pittsburgh Courier, one of the most socially progressive print publications of the time, and a chance meeting with Paul Robeson, an African-American actor and icon in the social justice movement of the 1940s, would change the course of her life. Don't you tire, every road goes higher and higher. Keep your hand on that low. Oh, the oh. Pittsburgh Courier got to us. I had never seen a black newspaper before. And there I discovered Marian Anderson, the NAACP, uh, all of what our people were doing, I discovered them in that newspaper. And we were given a project in the eighth grade of making a portfolio of uh, some, some event, something that interested us. And what interested me, what, what was happening with my people, that's when I became really aware. So at school, I started collecting history out of the Pittsburgh Courier. That's when I became really eager to be involved. When I was in 10th grade and I was going up to Hartford to school, I met Paul Robeson on the train. I was introduced to him by the man who used to pull me up onto the train just in time before it pulled out to take me to Hartford from Meriden to my music school. And he took me all the way into the parlor car, a very elegant place, and there sat this statue uh, of a greatness and introduced me to him and said, Someday you're going to be very proud of this young lady. And uh, Paul Robeson greeted me. I went soon after that uh, to a concert that he did. And he spoke. And it was when he spoke that I realized that's the artist I'm going to be. Just like that. Jesus did the candle by the water side to see the little children when they proudly baptized. Oh no, oh no, unto the dying lamb. Hope's participation in politics, protest, and her stand on civil rights reached a tipping point in 1949. In preparation for a benefit concert, she was to perform with Paul Robeson for the Civil Rights Congress near Peekskill, New York. Organizers were attacked and the concert had to be postponed. A week later, a peaceful audience of more than 20,000 attended the concert, but as they left, concert goers and artists alike were surrounded by an angry mob. We had the picnic up in New York, which was attacked, and uh, before I got there, and before Paul Robeson got there, they attacked the people who were setting the, the picnic up. So somehow they got the information to us to not go. We went back with people from all over the country, and so we went ahead 
We gave the concert with busloads of people from various parts of the the country, with families, children, and 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 um, when we left, the police were standing outside of the gates, and our fellows had surrounded it to protect us all. The um, police would only allow one way out. Uh, there were three ways to leave there, but they would only allow one way out. And on the way, there were people lined up with stones and yelling and insulting. There were trucks that had boulders in them, huge, huge rocks that the uh, uh, fellows would, uh, we might call them skinhead types, would pick up these boulders and drop them down into the cars and trucks. And I did see someone, we followed him to, uh, they took him to uh, a doctor's office um, whose face was just crushed. I prayed all day. This was a defining event in Hope's life. The things she witnessed on that day solidified her commitment to the movement for social justice. Her participation in civil rights activities made it harder still for her to find work in the U.S. Ironically, she was constantly denied the same civil liberties for which she was fighting. So that was when you wake up and discover you know, where you really are and what's really going on. Yeah, that was when I realized what the opposition was like. Because before it was warm from 25,000 people who sang with me. But here we saw the enemy with his weapons and the police with their arms folded watching it, doing nothing about our being stoned. And people were very seriously injured. So um, that was, of course, when I realized, as I say, I knew then that I was I was on the side that I needed to be on, which was in defense of of just being an American. And it wasn't just being a black American, although Paul Robeson being black, but the, everybody else was all mixed with everything. So it didn't have to do only with being black. Hope was an active member of the group called the People's Artists. This group was brought together to peacefully protest social injustice through the arts. After the Peekskill event, and because of her talent, the group sponsored Hope's participation in the World Youth Music Festival in East Berlin, where she received one of the top honors. Unfortunately, back in the U.S., Hope was subpoenaed for her participation in both events during the McCarran Committee hearings of 1951, in which artists were questioned about their communist involvements. Because Hope refused to give in to their demands of surrendering her passport like other artists of the era, Hope was forced to leave the U.S. in order to find work. People's artists, they raised the funds to send me to the World Youth Festival, and I came away with a prize that nobody ever heard of except them. These people felt that my t talent needed training, that what I had had before was fine, but it wasn't as much as I c could have to be more successful. And so they um, arranged for the funds, and I went to Mexico to study. <laughs> Throughout her career, Hope has had many extraordinary experiences. She traveled throughout Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, where she sang opera and performed in world-famous concert halls. She was a star in Tel Aviv and taught voice in Berlin for 10 years. But her true love affair was with Mexico, which gave her the greatest sense of acceptance. Hope felt completely at home in the Mexican culture. Her musical talents were appreciated regardless of her race, and she became a star after her very first concert. 
Hope also became one of the first and only black performers during the 1950s to have her own television show in Mexico. Mexico was a wonderful, wonderful, ex freeing experience. And I get, get to a country where people are as brown as I am, or their bronze, gorgeous bronze tone, uh, eyelashes so thick and so long that you couldn't believe it's real. And in Mexico, that was everywhere. And I felt totally part of them. I didn't know the language, and I learned it by having help in my home and singing, learning songs in the Spanish language, and not getting into the community of Americans, but being a part of the Mexican community. I had more exposure than they did uh, to it because of my singing and because of the people that I associated with uh, in my music field. They loved me. I had standing room only at my very first concert. The government uh, supported the arts and sent me all over the country, going to the universities uh, to, to perform, then getting my own television show, which couldn't have happened in America. Even our biggest and best black artists weren't uh, in television in America. Hope traveled between Mexico and the U.S. during the 1950s and 1960s. It was during one of her visits back home that she was reminded of the differences between the two countries. After her success in Mexico, Hope was asked to perform in Las Vegas. There, the fame of Mexico turned to a familiar pain of prejudice. I went to Las Vegas, and when I got there, I wasn't allowed to eat in the dining room. The girl who was the strip teaser could. She was an Asian girl. She was my roommate because we were both colored, see. But she was allowed to go to the dining room and bring me my dinner in the, in the dressing room. In the 1950s, for a brief period, Hope moved back home to the U.S. and lived in Los Angeles with her family. She was mistaken for a foreigner because she and her family spoke fluent Spanish. However, when the neighbors realized she was a black American, doors began closing in her face and she was no longer welcome to live in the community. This intolerance forced Hope to return to Mexico. We only spoke Spanish to my little girl because she didn't know English. But then when they went to school and made friends, some of those friends came and we were speaking English because my older girl spoke English before we went away. So uh, up, till, up till then, we all spoke Spanish because the little one couldn't understand if we didn't. So when these Americans came to visit us, they heard us speaking English. And the, the, we started having our, the cars blocked. But they couldn't leave. I, w I spoke to the owner of the place. I said, would you please come and, ask and, and, and move the car? It was his car. And uh, he said, when I finish my meal, I'll f come down there. And the attitude was very clear. New Year's Eve, there were stones thrown at our door. And I got phone call from the owner begging us to leave because the neighbors didn't want us there. So there was just nothing to keep me here anymore. You know, I just realized that this was not a welcome place. Uh, we went back to Mexico. Some have described Hope's voice as one of the most valuable on the continent. Others have remarked on the hypnotic quality that often moves people to tears. The more I see you, the more I want you. Somehow this feeling just 
just grows and grows. Hope has always appreciated her gift, but humbly says that it is only through practice and learned techniques that she is able to accomplish the levels of excellence she has been praised for. For Hope, music is more than a beautiful sound. It is the way to deliver a message that resonates with everyone. For nearly a century, Hope Foy's songs have carried her stories of the struggle for justice, acceptance, and freedom around the world. For me, music is a message, my way of, of bringing messages to others. I sing from the heart. That's the reason why people like it. I feel that I'm not a great voice, but that uh, the way I sing from the heart and from my soul is, is what reaches people and why people say, you made me cry. It's like a great accomplishment. And I feel when a person suddenly has this sound and has this feeling that they'd never known before, that I've, I've really done a great thing. <laughs> and that's my legacy, that they can tell the story through music, any story, anybody through the arts can express all that's within themselves. Hope's dream of singing at the Met never came to life because of the intolerance confronting her at every turn. Undaunted, she used her remarkable gift, her voice, to loosen the injustices binding her and others. That powerful tool for freedom took her to distant parts of the world where she attained the applause and respect denied to her at home. Hope Foy is still making a difference today. Now living in the U.S., this remarkable woman who has lived eight decades and seen and experienced many of the social and racial changes that have shaped our country still teaches, sings, and fights for equality. Audiences remain captivated by the purity of her voice and generosity of a spirit that compels her to keep singing her songs. That is a man, a person, who speaks the truth about what is going on in the world. An aware person. And that's the kind of an artist that I have devoted myself to being. That I sing, I sing messages. That's how I tell my stories and how I try to in make people understand about love, brotherhood, friendship. <laughs>